Okay, thanks. I'm actually going to um, have a one-page overview here of uh, just for this project so that you can check out some of this uh, data on your own. And for those of you who are just at the previous presentation, we're going to talk a bit about a precursor to forest fragmentation and efforts to, to track uh, parcelization over time in Vermont. I think a lot of you are familiar with this concept of parcelization, of breaking up of parcels into smaller and smaller parcels usually done through subdivision, um, which is a legal process for landowners to divide their, their land into multiple parcels. And uh, it's usually a step towards new development over time and the infrastructure that goes, that goes with it. And so, um, you know, that can impact both the ecological and economic viability of, of, of forest parcels for working lands and for a host of ecological functions uh, and impacts, which, uh, which many of us are, are interested in understanding. Um, so it's a bit different from outright forest loss or, for, or forest fragmentation. Um, but of course we're interested in is there a relationship. And so I just wanted to give you the context of a recent statistic here on outright forest loss just so you can piece that together with the, the stats I'm going to give you on parcelization. But according to the Forest Service, at least according to their FIA data, the most recent 2017 report that just came out, they're estimating that Vermont may have lost up to um, 102,000 acres of, of forest land uh, outright due to the forest cover loss. Um, so in order to minimize that, then we need to track kind of parcelization or subdivision as a precursor uh, to try and understand, you know, what the, what the threat is potentially for, for this phenomenon of outright forest loss. Uh, so we've been doing this research now for a number of years. This is actually the third phase, phase three report, which we just wrapped up. Um, we did put out two previous reports, one that looked at statewide trends through 2003 and 2009, then a phase two where we actually combed through the subdivision records of 22 case study towns to understand what was the relationship to local regulation or statewide development review law, Act 250, and see how that was impacting parcelization rates. This is now stepping back and essentially building the statewide database for a much longer period of time. So essentially 2004 to 2016, building the state database for parcelization. Uh, of course, want to give props to NSRC, our funder, um, for this work. We had an a, a ambitious steering committee and partners helping out. I do want to recognize two in particular, Brian Voigt uh, from here at UVM essentially created the database and then Steve Sharp at Vermont Center for Geographic Information essentially developed the website, which I'll show you, and then we had our collaborators. Um, not going to spend a lot of time here on the goals, but essentially we're looking at trying to understand what's the viability of maintenance of large parcels in Vermont to maintain the economic and ecological functions of our landscape, how much residential development is happening, what's the status of large undeveloped parcels, and what's the rate of their loss, and how do all these trends impact forest management, forest policy, um, and, and programs that support resource management in Vermont. So essentially what Brian Voigt did is he collected information that was available through the grand list. So that's property tax collection information collected by a lot of listers across the state um, and then also was able to aggregate the current use program, use value appraisal program uh, data. We designed or, or put it into a number of different metrics just to, to understand how to analyze, analyze the data. Um, there's a phase three report, which I'll show you where you can access that, and then, and then a website, which I'll show you as well. So the report will give you a lot of analysis about the trends. The website will allow you to actually go in and look at the data, grab the data yourself if it's something that you're interested in downloading. Um, just very quickly, the uses and limitations. We believe this data is really helpful to understand statewide trends. And then we can understand, okay, where do we need to do some emphasis on technical assistance? How can this inform conservation planning or land use planning? Big picture. It's not for parcel level information or land value information at the parcel level. There's listers that may have uh, a bit of inconsistency in how they're reporting out uh, the classification of land for property tax purposes. So we're just using this for big picture trend analysis. Okay, so getting into the data. Um, and this is private land, so that's property tax collection purposes. We're just looking at this database of private land trends. Um, in 2016, you can see that there was roughly a decent percentage of the state that was still represented in parcels 50 acres or larger. One thing we looked at in this study was trying to differentiate smaller parcels versus larger parcels. Arbitrary del delineation of 50 acres, and that was just based on steering committee input of, of a way to measure small versus larger parcels parcels. 
So what you can see is over 70% of the land is actually represented in parcels 50 acres or larger, which is great. But then when you look at the classification, and so the classifications we looked at were residential. Is there a dwelling associated with the land? That's the listers classification. Is it woodland, which is the undeveloped forest land category? Is it farmland? Or we looked at an other category, which is essentially utilities, commercial land, and catch-all for a number of other uh, categories that don't get at residential woodland or farmland. So woodland is 23%. So why we, for purposes of, of us today, understanding trends in, in forest land, very promising statistic that there's a lot of land in large parcels. Undeveloped forest land represents a minority of that, that land. And that went down 3% over the study period. Okay, so we're tracking what you would expect to happen through the subdivision process over time, right? No real earth shattering development here statistically that we're creating smaller and smaller parcels through the subdivision process. What's interesting though is that the highest rate of loss was in this large, you know, 200 acres or larger category and the greatest increase was in the 2 to 5 and 5 to 10 acre category. That tracks probably with a lot of zoning that we see across Vermont for minimum lot sizes in certain areas other than maybe more of the urban, urban or city areas. Um, but we're actually, you know, we're able to quantify here um, uh, what's going on, you know, over time. And um, so the number of smaller parcels under 50 acres increased by um, close to 8,750 parcels across Vermont. And then we, we see net loss in these larger acreage uh, sizes. Okay, so then looking at what's going on with the larger parcels, because um, we know that they are really important for maintaining resilient landscape. Um, so we measured this, this decline um, over time. Obviously before the market crash in 2009, there was more, more volatility and a higher rate of loss and that kind of leveled out but continued the decline over time with a you know, kind of consistent uh, steady decline. And, um, and so you know, this is one trend to focus on. Now I will say that um, based on this you know, 110,000 acre um, loss, some land did transfer into public ownership. And so, um, and that's, that's positive, and that means that the, the, you know, the status of it as a large parcel didn't necessarily decrease, it's just a difference. And so it's important to say that not all of this loss was outright, um, it's not represented still in large parcel status. Okay, and then we looked at the, the different categories, okay? And so for one, we saw that this residential category, you know, increased by 7% or 160, over 162,000 acres over the study period time. And then the, the, the category that received the highest rate of decrease by far was the woodland category, undeveloped forest land in the state. And that was about a 15% decrease. Now again, we're estimating that maybe 25,000 acres went into public ownership. That was based on surveying of all federal and state agencies and land trust community. Could be higher than that because we didn't capture municipal projects. Um, but let's just say that's, that's somewhat accurate. And we still saw about a 12% decrease outright of undeveloped forest land parcels moving into another category. Likely residential because we saw such a large uptick in residential. Some of it could be the farm or the other category, utility, commercial. Um, but this was the, the statistic that really jumped out at us. This is a 12-year study period, and that's a pretty fast rate of, of decline. Okay, and then we looked at well, this broken out into the larger parcels, and um, you know, somewhat consistent here that a lot of that loss, which I was just talking about in, in the woodland category, was actually happening in large parcels. So that's equally concerning that we're not only just losing the status of our undeveloped forest land, but it's happening in, in larger parcels um, as well here. And you see the increase in residential. Um, and so that's just a way, a different way of looking at the looking at the data. And then we also understood, you know, where are their new dwellings? So we know that it's, it's when the dwellings go in, it's the infrastructure that's associated with the dwellings that leads to fragmentation and outright conversion and a tendency over time to have more and more potential development as undeveloped parcels become developed. Here we were able to uh, quantify that for parcels under 50 acres in size, we had you know, 20,737 parcels now had a dwelling associated with it that didn't have a dwelling before. So this is really interesting because I think a lot of us, um, the narrative in Vermont is we don't have population growth really happening. That doesn't mean we don't have subdivision happening and that doesn't mean that we don't have homes being built, including seasonal or secondary homes. 
And so the take home message here is that subdivisions happening, dwellings are being built on the landscape, um, and you can't just look at population growth as the metric to what's going on from a land use perspective. We also looked at land values. Essentially, they doubled over the study period. So this is general average land value here uh, doubled, and woodland values also doubled, um, although you know per acre, obviously, undeveloped forest land is not, <coughs> not as valuable. Um, but still, this puts pressure on landowners and forest landowners to be able to hold on to their land unless they're in the current use program or doing something proactively to help with the carrying costs. And we also looked at UVA. I do want a really important caveat just very quickly is that um, uh, we're updating the UVA data. We, we realized that there were a couple categories that were uh, incomplete in the first analysis, and so we're rounding that out within the next month. Uh, but essentially the trend here is we're creating through subdivision smaller and smaller parcels that are being enrolled in our current use program, which adds an administrative burden. We're not creating more land, but we're just creating more parcels that can be enrolled. So that's, that's interesting. We also quantified that... Um, the UVA program actually retains undeveloped forest land woodland at a higher rate than land that's outside of the program. So I'm not going to really have time to go into the website, um, but I wanted to let you know, and on what Sheeta handed out, you can go to this and you can actually explore the data at the county level, the regional planning commission level, statewide, or even at the town-wide level. You can go into all the different metrics that we had, and you can actually explore the data. You can do understand comparisons, rate of change, uh, over the study period of time, you can just hone in on a certain range of years. You can look at uh, woodland in particular, how many new dwellings are associated. Um, you can download the raw data, generate geographically specific reports. Um, and you can also download the phase three report that I mentioned and the other parcelization reports um, that we've, we've generated. And all this can be really helpful to, if you're involved in local land use planning understand what's actually going on with parcel change in the town. Act 171 now requires towns to actually plan to maintain intact forest blocks and connectivity areas. It can be very helpful for that. And a way, way to evaluate the effectiveness of zoning or subdivision regulations if you have them or try and understand should we actually have subdivision regulations if a town doesn't. Obviously to inform where there are priorities for potentially conservation planning, land conservation projects. Um, to identify a threat or a challenge in an area to justify federal funding going towards conservation projects. Um, and also to help foresters understand, well, where, where might we want to look at increasing, you know, current use enrollment? Where are there gaps? Where are we seeing large decreases in enrollment? Um, I'm not going to go through the recommendations because you have it in the handout, um, but just we did look at, you know, what would be state policy? Um, you know, how do we continue to uh, uh, kind of address this, this, these rates of, of forest land parcel uh, loss and how do we infuse with lim limited money in the state, how do we still have effective programs that can, can help willing landowners hold on to intact forest land parcels and, and how do we encourage you know, some of the gaps, let's say, in the development review process that exist, whereas Act 250 really doesn't have effective forest criteria or anything to address fragmentation. And I just wanted to mention, of course, there's local action that can be taken with, on the planning side, but you know, maybe for purposes of today's uh, focus on the research front and um, you know, specifically to what Jarlath was talking about before, we really do want to understand what is this connection? You know, can we actually show a relationship and study the relationship of parcelization and subdivision to forest fragmentation and forest loss? How quickly does it happen? You know, what's the association there? Um, obviously understand, continue to understand more how dwellings and infrastructure um, impact the integrity of forest and then ideally maintain this parcelization website over time so as a LIDAR then continues over time to be updated we can continue to make those associations and help our planning and policy making technical assistance and management in Vermont. So with that I see that I've um, out of time and I think maybe we have time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Jamie, so, so many different things to ask about, but I want to ask about this aspect of what I heard you say. So you've got large parcels that are being broken up into smaller parcels that are getting dwelt, but then they're going into use value, right? So does that mean that there's an increase in the demand on use value, or is it just a transfer 
of say ownership, like uh, owner A had 500 acres right. and now owner A has 450 and owner B has 50, right. 49 of which are in current use. And so what's the money flow look like to the town or from the state in that scenario? Right, so that's a great question. And I think a little bit, I think both are happening. That there continues to be new enrollment of people who are just choosing to go into the program. And then through subdivision, there's more parcels that are being created that are being enrolled, adding smaller parcels. And the financial impact is because the state reimburses towns um, for the, the portion of revenue um, that is being lost by going into current use. Uh, smaller and smaller parcels tend to have a higher value. And so for the state, there's a, an increase in expenditure there to hold towns harmless, which puts per annual pressure on the program and the legislature wanting to examine what's the cost of the program, even though the benefits far outweigh the costs of that reimbursement and lost tax revenue. Um, it stresses the county foresters by having more and more smaller parcels that are being enrolled. It's not necessarily a bad thing that forest landowners are still enrolling in the program, but it's, uh, it's, it's an, a very good question and one that I think, you know, we need to look at the long-term viability of the program and will we be able to maintain smaller and smaller parcels going in, which we still want to maintain overall, you know, landscape connectivity, um, but the financial pressure of that could be difficult. Jamie, your, your analysis is primarily statewide yep. because of the limitations of the Grandland State, it sounds like, but what do you think it would, it would take to contextualize some of the results so that you have a better understanding whether it's agriculture that's being converted or parcelized or um, urban zones, other ex-urban areas, or um, ski towns, or how do how would you provide you know, that additional increment of information for the type of work? Yeah, and if we had more time, we could go in. The website allows you to do some spatial examination, but it's basically just aggregating the data at the town level, and then you can look at it statewide and see where there's different um, uh, changes or, or higher level of you know forest land loss, for example. But that's really you know the next step is then spatially, you know, how do we begin to to understand at the parcel level? So when we have digital parcel maps, which is right now they're underway in Vermont, I think we're close to in year three of a three-year process to get digital parcel maps, it's going to be a lot, it's going to be really interesting then to take this to the next level and start examining it at, at that scale to understand where exactly, you know, is the change happening? Is it associated, you know, with parcels close to ski areas, for example? Um, you know, where is it happening? Um, we did, in a phase two project, we did look at four case study towns where there, where there were digital parcel maps, and we found that about 50 to 70 percent of the subdivisions were happening in intact forest blocks that were mapped by the state. And so I think the state's done a really good job of valuing our agricultural lands from a land use planning purpose. Um, but forests to a large degree are kind of a default. It's where we're developing a lot. Um, and this is kind of the challenge that we have now statewide is trying to uh, improve our attention to how that pattern happens in the forest. So, uh, we have your questions today. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, thanks.